Okay, everyone, we're going to get uh, started. Welcome everyone to our first, I suppose, webinar for our young referees, which is called Top Tips for Young Referees, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful and we forgot we were going to have to call it out on this. Uh, we're delighted today to be joined by um, some of our top people involved in both referee education and referee in itself. So delighted we have Shane Corley, who's one of our national referees. So Shane, we'll give you all a little wave there. Um, How are you? McHugh is also one of our referees and was on our recent Learn to Lead program and also delivers our referee education. So, so highly involved. Sinead will give us a little wave too. And then Claire Dowdle is our National Development Officer for with a responsibility for referee education. So very much involved in, in this area and has been doing a huge amount of work for referee education. I suppose I should have said myself as well, Lynn Savage, I'm National Development Manager. So we're looking forward to this chat today and thanks to everyone who sent in questions when you registered today, which was great. Um, and it, hopefully we're touching some of the topics that, that will help you to get back on the pitches. So without further ado, we're going to get straight into it. And if anyone has any questions um, as we go through this, it will be about a half an hour. And if you have any questions, you'll see a Q&A on the bottom of your screen. Feel free to type in any questions and we'll come back to them. Um, I'll pose them to the panel that's here in front of you. So. We have three uh, clear themes that came across for our panel today, and they haven't got the questions yet, so they're looking anxiously going, I hope I know the answer. Um, but the first theme that was kind of came true from all young referees was getting back on the pitch, because obviously that's a big thing now for the long break. We then have creating a positive environment, and then finally we'll have a little section on the rules. So getting back on the pitch, we get started. And Shane, I'm going to go straight to you. Um, you have plenty of experience as a national referee, uh, but also you're refereeing in your own county. So you've seen, you've refereed at all age groups. But one of the questions that was asked there was, uh, how would you recommend preparing for and getting over your first official match as a referee? Because there's a lot of young referees who might have done a course but haven't actually refereed yet. Okay, yeah, we've all, we've all been there guys and you know it can be daunting so you know the first thing you just have to be is is be yourself the, the one thing that I was told when I when I became a referee was you know just because you put on a referee's set of jerseys and socks and shorts it, it shouldn't change you so to, to go out to a match and be yourself that's the first thing that I would say to you don't don't try and be somebody else um, just be prepared know your rules be confident. You know, you're going to make mistakes. Mistakes are part and parcel of the game. And, you know, apart from, apart from that, and it goes without saying, you know, just being mentally prepared, you know, having a good night's sleep before a game, being fit, that's important. And above all, have a great knowledge of the rules. So I would always have the, the rule book on hand. Take a quick read of it before every match. And at least that does away with any of those doubts that might be in your mind that you have read the rules, you know the rules, and be confident on the pitch. So when you're going out there, you know, don't be afraid to blow the whistle, especially with younger players. They need to know the sound of the whistle. They need to be able to hear it. So you might be fearful as a referee and a little bit nervous, and that can come through in the blowing of the whistle. So if they can't hear it, you know, they're, they're, they might pick up on that and you might feel extra anxious. So give a good blow to the whistle, get your signals, tell them what it's for, explain to them and explain to them in their language. I think that is a very important thing, especially when you're talking to younger, younger children. They mightn't understand. You have to be 13 meters away from the ball. They mightn't understand what 13 meters is. So explain it to them, show it to them, explain it to the, to, in, in their language. But even for myself as a national referee, getting back after the pandemic and, and back onto the pitch, that's also daunting for me as well because we're out of match practice. So I would say, you know, just go through the motions, the same motions for every game. Prepare mentally, physically, be hydrated, know the rules, and be confident, not cocky. You know, don't be authoritative out there in terms of, you know, extra authoritative. Um, but you need to, you need to lay, lay down the law at the, at the end of the day. You, you, are, the, you are the peacekeeper. You are the, 
the facilitator of the rules and you know that that's what the players want they want somebody that's that's fair that's great Shane and, and I think a key part in that was it is okay to be nervous like as you said even in some of your own games you will come across nervous and you touched some great points that's going to come up as well around the whistle and signals so um, I think we're going to get plenty out of this webinar and um, to try and help for the first games and I suppose Sinead just passing across to yourself and you've talked about a young referee trying to referee their first official game uh, what do you remember maybe about your first official game that you had to referee and if there was two key things maybe you feel you've learned since then that has helped you what would those two things be? Um, I thought, geez, and I, uh, first game, I know probably, I can't actually remember my first official game. Um, and it's probably, I think first official game I probably did in 2018. Um, or yeah, latter part of 2018, I don't remember it. But I remember actually refereeing, probably goes back to Shane's point, actually um, being prepared. The first game I did was probably about 12, 14 years ago, um, where I was asked to do a challenge game involved my own club actually um, and like that I wasn't prepared um, I wasn't I was just thrown in the referee hadn't shown up or whatever so and so it's the one thing that I remember from that it was one particular call I didn't make that I should have made and yeah it goes back to that being being prepared knowing your rules inside out and a communication part of it so yeah that that probably the first game I remember but to be honest, yeah, the game scenarios was as an official referee. I don't really remember, to be honest with you, because you, you know, people come off field and they'll say to you, what players played well? And I can honestly tell you, I can't say what players played well, because as a referee, you're actually just so focused on, you know, the fouls, keeping up with play, doing your calls, your signals, all of that. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a full-time job whenever you're doing it. And it is, and, and I know from chatting to plenty of referees, um, particularly referees who are just starting off to say it can be difficult because you've been watching games or playing as a player and then to have to switch into referee mode um, can be difficult. But you've, you've touched on two really important things there around um, knowing the rules, which Shane has mentioned as well, is a key thing because that helps your confidence as well um, and being prepared. So I think they're, they're two very good tips. And I know any referees who've listened to this who have done the go games and youth course, it's, it's a big part of it of getting prepared because then you arrive at the pitch feeling a little more confident um, than you would. And I suppose, Claire, just to bring you into discussion as well, um, some of the young referees that were posing questions were asking, is there anything they need to know maybe as a go games referee now that they're returning after COVID-19? Is it different as a, as a go games referee, even down to maybe where they should leave their gear because dressing rooms aren't open? Uh, so the little things that maybe are Setting, setting referees off that they're not confident. Have you anything on that that might help them? Yeah, definitely. I think um, now everybody's coming out of the cocoon. They're feeling a wee bit nervous, but what I would say is, you know, don't be, go out there. And once you get the first game over you, it's over you. Um, we have some very simple protocols in line with the GA and the Camogie Association that we followed. Um, and they're all on the GA website. If you actually even type in COVID education or our own website, you'll see a huge amount of resources. But the three main things sort of around that is that the referee has did the COVID education and got the cert certification for it. And they have a copy of that. The second thing is that they've did their health questionnaire and that they really just declare that before a game saying that they have feeling well and then they've no temperature or anything like that. So they're fit and able to referee the game. And the third thing would be to just read the referee guidelines regarding matches, the slight changes, you know, that they're hand sanitizing as soon as they arrive at the ground, um, before a game, after the game. And as you said, Lynn, there's no changing rooms open. We all know that. So if they want to leave their kit bag or car keys, I would say make sure as a referee you come completely ready. And whatever gear you need, you take out and you ask the COVID supervisor for the club at both games level when you arrive. Can they... Um, take your bag with maybe your car keys in it and put it somewhere secure and um, while you go on and referee the game. So um, in, in terms of, of that, it's just following the key simple points that, that are well advertised out there. Perfect. And obviously at goal games level, um, many young referees maybe are the home clubs, so they're, they're a player, so it might be slightly different protocol, uh, just that they can their home te uh, team supervisor will cover them. But yeah, no, yeah, they're perfect. And I suppose it just helps to get the guidelines out there as well. 
The second, I suppose, big thing that came across from people who are sending in questions, and we've got plenty of them, uh, there's plenty of questions for the rest. Sinead, I'm going to fire this one back at you. Um, they wanted to know maybe what are some of the tips for making a game run smoothly and when you know when to let the game play, let the flow, um, or to give it free, and maybe does signals help in, in that also? Yeah, yeah. I know. I'm, I'm going to throw that to Sinead first, and then we'll bring you oh, in, Shane, if that's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it's something I suppose I always say, Lynn, um, whenever the two captains actually come in for the toss, the coin, I'd always say three points, and one of them is always about the pawing, the pulling, the pushing. I just don't want to see it in a game, and I'm going to call it every single time. So I give them the heads up, first of all, because I find the pawing is a big one in games now. Um, where players are just constantly pointing at the arms or shoulders or the legs. And the second thing is then during the game, I'm always communicating to the players. So I'm kind of doing a run and commentary of the game as well. And there are certainly times, obviously, you can play advantage for your five seconds. But it's for me, then, it's trying to ensure that I'm looking ahead. What are the, you know, the two or three steps for the player ahead? Does she have a clear path through? Or if I let this go, is she you know, going to be stopped by another player, whatever the case is. So it's it's trying to, you know, it's not just keeping up with play, it's trying to read what's going to happen in the next two to three plays. Um, and that will have a big bearing on, do I give advantage or do I stop it there and then and give the, and give the free as well? Perfect, very good. And I suppose that brings us nicely into the next question. And Shane, um, I know Sinead said it's not always about being in the right, in the right place, it's part of it. But being in the right place is also important. And just a few referees want to know if you have any tips maybe on referee positioning and um, to better spot infringements and what's the benefits of making sure you're in the best position have you any tips around this yeah i mean it's 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 vital really i mean you know being a referee refereeing from the middle of the pitch just doesn't work now i know what maybe at goal games levels the pitches are very small and sometimes you can actually be in the way um you know kids can you know generally congregate into a group around a ball so you know the last thing you want to be is, is is kind of reversing back out of the way so certainly you know having a distance there that you can actually see sometimes you can be actually too close to the play to actually spot what's going on but you know alongside be, be alongside the play is, is what I would always say and have a good view of the ball because inevitably that's what we're looking at you know so many coaches they don't coach the tackle properly and when that ball is being held into the body you can't be legally dispossessed of the ball and that's where all the slapping as Sinead has has mentioned the pawing comes into it so if you explain that at the start and then you're up beside the players you know give your give your good signals and explain to them what you're doing you know I think I think that's I think that's vital and I think you mentioned it as well Shane um sometimes with the little goal games Sometimes it's it's not necessarily that they meant to foul, but maybe they weren't sure how to tackle. So it nearly becomes a bit of a coach and a referee at the one time. Absolutely, and it's l let me tell you that it's it's not just go games that um, that that comes into <laughs> the the fray because the tackle to me, whether you're in in lads football or ladies football or whatever, the tackle is the most important thing. That's what you're giving. The, that's what the frees are conceded uh, around, and. I mean, they're, you can't touch the player when they have the ball into their, you know, you can't even touch the ball. So, you know, this, it's not like a shoulder to shoulder challenge. You can't do that. You can play the ball away with the open hand or hands as it's about to be played and it's away from the body. And that's the only tackle that's available in ladies football. Apart from that, you can stand with your hands out and force the player into, make, into taking four steps or, you know, taking the time with the ball that might have taken four steps. Um, and that's really it. Apart from that, you're just forcing them into, into fouling the ball themselves. The tackle, the, that's it. Yeah, and it is, it's, it's so important for, for coaches to know, and I suppose if, if we have any coaches that watch this back or even players themselves, we did recently do a Coach the Tackle webinar uh, which is available on our YouTube channel. It's excellent. Just go through the points chains after going through there now. Even for referees, if you're unsure, you'll, you'll really get it from us. And so that brings us nicely. Um, Sinead, sometimes as a referee, um, it can be difficult, but maybe 
dealing with shouting and abuse maybe from the sidelines and particularly for a young referee it can be detrimental to the progression of their career it, have you any tips maybe of how to block people out uh, and you've mentioned this kind of briefly how you get so into the zone as a referee and um, how you can how you can block them out and especially if it's a manager maybe that gets repetitive and how you deal with the situation yeah and so it's that was Lynn whenever I started off that's you know you're trying to listen to everything and you're trying to take things on board whereas going through the games then yeah like that I get so zoned into the game that I don't hear what's going on outside or spectators or that and it probably helps like Shane saying you're concentrating on keeping up with the game you're concentrating on the players they're asking you questions you're talking to them or you know keeping an eye on subs or injuries or whatever the case is so but I think one big piece of advice that I got starting out refereeing that I've brought with me now is I don't take feedback from anyone that I wouldn't ask for advice. So if I wouldn't go to the manager or to that spectator for advice, then I don't want their feedback. Um, so I use that all the time now because at the end of the day, I walk off the field, I know myself if I've had a good game or not, or if I have one or two trusted people there, then I'll ask them. But apart from that, I don't ask anyone else. Um, so that probably helped me as regards going in out the interference or abuse or whatever the case is, you know, being shouted at players or me or whatever. But yeah, I, I just I don't hear it now to be honest. Yeah, and, and it's so it's so important, like obviously particularly for our young referees that they are protected um in relation to it. And uh, we've been quoted on many an occasion that the only person the game can't go ahead without is the referee um, and that we should value that importance. So it is so important. And I'm just going to revert back to Shane just for a question following on from Sinead's there. And Shane, you mentioned earlier about the whistle and that it's possibly one of the most important items that you pack with you as a referee. Have you maybe just expand on some of the tips you had in relation to using the whistle there and, and how it can benefit young player or young referees? Yeah, definitely. It's it. it I mean, it, it's the it's the major tool that you're going to bring in in the toolbox in your in your kit bag, and you need to be able to use it right because, you know, you're not going to be you're not going to be speaking, you're not going to be giving a running commentary the whole game, and your whistle is there to, you know, to let players know that you know the the game is starting, whether that's from a kickout, so you're you're going to give a a certain type of a blow of the whistle for that. And fouls as well, you know, you're, you're go you need to be, that's the time of the, the game you need to be, you have to have that authoritative style in you. You need to give it a good, confident blow. There's nothing as bad, and I've been, you know, on the sideline and, and the hurler on the ditch, as, as they say, and you, sometimes you can't actually hear a referee blowing the whistle, and you're kind of wondering, well, did they blow it or did they mean to blow it? But you know, give it a good blow. It, it's a signal. And remember that it's not just the person beside you that needs to hear that whistle. It's the person out in the stand, in the dugout, down in the goal mouth, that they need to know that, okay, that was a foul. Definitely the signal was loud and clear. Don't just half blow it or don't be afraid to let it ring in your ears. It, it, it's a really, really important thing. And, and, and I was told that, you know, in my early days, give, give it a good blow, even from some, some um, people that were involved in the, in the LGFA watching me from the sidelines, you know, they said, don't be afraid to blow the whistle. And, and that's, that's my advice to you guys. Do not be afraid to blow it. It does show that, that confidence, as you said, Shane, and yep. um, like for the people on the sideline or, or down at the goal mouth or whatever, you said that, that strong whistle and a clear signal at least people know then exactly what the free is for and it really helps. And Claire, just to come back to yourself, if you have a young referee and maybe they have got abused at a match which you'd be hoping they don't or they've got language thrown at them, have you any advice maybe on, on where they go to with their county or what steps they need to take um, because it's not something we want them to deal with? Yeah, well, it's something that they definitely have to um, go to somebody about. There's too many people that just do let it roll over and that's not good either um, because there's a referee coming behind you. So I would encourage them to report it and they can do that by contacting whoever appointed them with their fixture. So it could be their county fixture secretary 
or we have been running um, referee support programs during COVID for counties and trying to encourage them to have somebody in place that referees go to um, to give them advice on. Um, I, I would also suggest that, refer that young referees, you know, ask for a buddy or a mentor, somebody that they can rely on and lean on and say, look, this happened in my game today. I made this decision. I don't think it was the right decision. What call would you have made? And that can all help support them and, and develop them, but definitely to report it to their fixtures and um, secretary or their referee coordinator. Um, and, and if they're doing that, a referee can write down exactly what happened, either even at goal game level, you know, what the abuse was, and um, they can write it down and, and keep it straight after the pitch. It's always fresh in their mind. Um, and any county board will deal with that straight away because nobody wants to see it in the game, um, especially starting off. Perfect. And as you said, that word for word account is so important. And um, just that you know exactly exactly what was said. And I suppose on on the support part as well, as Claire said, we want to keep everyone in it. But one of the questions that kind of we're, we're deviating into the rules a little bit now. Uh, but one of the questions that was asked by a ref and our young referee and Shane, I'll come back to yourself on this. They wanted to know, are, are umpires required at juvenile matches? But if they are or not, how can umpires help them? Yeah, that's, you know, we, we, we'd all love to have four umpires at every single match. But, you know, we have to be realistic that that's, that's sometimes an impossibility. Sometimes there aren't, you know, four or five people at some games. It, 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 can, be, it can be really, really difficult. At national level, naturally enough, we, we will always have that ability to to get our umpires and they are a great great help for us both on the way to the match and on the way back from the match and just picking up on something that has been mentioned earlier about you know having that conversation with somebody having a mentor having a buddy along with you and being able to talk to somebody sometimes that can be your umpire and just getting that off your chest at the end of the game going back to the original question should should we have them it's always best to have umpires, if at all possible, if you can bring them. If you can bring neutral ones, all the best. But generally, you're going to be going to your club games and you're going to be maybe pulling one from either side. What those umpires mightn't realise is that they are actually becoming an official of the game that when, the, when the whistle is blown. But they don't see it that way. They start coaching from the goal the side of the goalpost and shouting in maybe a little bit of abuse or trying to encourage their team along and that can be nearly a distraction for you as well and take from your own game you need to have that equality you need to have that neutrality as well from your umpires uh, to avoid conflict down the line because there's no point in pretending it's not it's not going to happen you can read the rule book inside out and upside down there's always going to be someone that's going to you know, have it in your ear from the sideline or whatever. But um, yeah, your umpires they need to they need to to uh, to be neutral for certain, and it's good to have them if you can get them. Yeah, and I know even from a few of our goal games courses and youth courses, we were saying a lot of young referees in those courses are all on the same boat. They're all starting out, so even teaming up with each other to to help each other out and, and spot each other at the start can can be a help as well and a support. And so speaking of goal games, Sinead. Um, as we know, goal games rules can change from age to age. So you could be refereeing under nines today and under 12s tomorrow and under 10s oh, yeah. tomorrow. And it can be difficult, I suppose, to remember um, which games you're doing and what rules. Have you any tips? Obviously, you've gone from goal games to youth games to adult games. Have you any tips on, on what a referee can do to keep up with? Okay, this is the game I'm at tonight. Yeah, so, and that's... To be honest, Lynn, they're probably the most difficult games to do. Um, probably give me a senior game any day over your on over your goal games because, like that, you say the rules differ um from age group and within county then. Um, I'd always have the rule book in my kit bag or like that. Um, every county will have their own goal games rules. Print them out and actually have them in your kit bag before you go to your game, make sure whether it's the night before you actually run through your goal games rules, you know exactly, you know, how many minutes each way, all of those um, rules, but like exactly what you're saying earlier, you need to know your rules inside out, um, upside down, back to front, like, so yeah, I'd say print them out and going through them. And even if you don't have games week on week, 
you should be taking them out every week and you know going through so they just become second nature to you perfect and, and Claire on that you might have a few referees online who aren't sure where to get the rules of the games that they're doing in their county and um, could you maybe let them know what's the best avenues and also is there any I suppose differences that happen in a lot of goal games and um, like we say one touch of the ball there might be a few that's kind of generic that might help some refs now yeah um i think the first protocol is they have to count, contact their county secretary and ensure that they have the goal game rules and um, when we're delivering of course we usually have that for them when we provide them with it but they need to make sure that when it's updated that they have the update of it because some counties then will do uh, have the square ball in place some counties won't and and the big one on that it what you hear back is because the pitches are different dimensions there mightn't be a square lined out so as a goal game referee you're looking you there is a square ball on this how can i ensure that i can see the square so you're looking to see possibly can you have cones out on the lines or can you flag um, and it's the same with kickouts where the kickouts going to come from in goal games and ensuring that you know the place from each goal and um, there's other like differences between your as you said earlier as they go up the age groups it comes from one you're only allowed one bounce and one solo um and then it goes on to being allowed to have maybe two bounces two solos um and then straight away that it's full rules maybe come under 11 under 12 uh, there's also differences regarding the point in the goal system so it's clear that you know that sometimes the point is actually worth three and the goal is only worth one so they're real common ones as you go up the system. They're trying to encourage um, at younger age groups that a point is is worth more. And then as they get older, it's back in to the goal. Um, so in, in terms of in terms of all that, the other big one I always find is zones. There actually is zones in goal games and um, to help with positioning, which we talked about earlier. And it's trying to see if your county is implementing them and and you know how do you implement the zones is it marked out clearly before you go on and does everybody understand what the zones are uh, and the big one from us i would say we have the referee digital handbook online and um, in our website on our referee hub and that, that has just so much information for young referees starting out and there's videos on in it and um, it's such a great resource and it's really worth using that and we also have our main goal game rules that we we suggest counties that use on our website too so yeah, that's a good yeah. point of contact to start and in fairness to Tara there's as she said mentioned the handbook and it's something we we're going to come back to at the end as well it's a huge resource there and in fairness to Tara the amount of time they were spending cutting videos to match fouls and it's an excellent resource for a referee any age group really um Shane just before we I suppose we're, we're coming towards the end so if anyone has any questions they can fire them in the Q&A there but we can't let the rules go because we did have a few people who asked what is your opinion on what the most controversial rule is or one that you would like players and mentors to know more about? <laughs> there are a few of them that, that, that continuously crop up, I have to say, and it, they're all based around the tackle. The, the one that I mentioned earlier on, the ball being held into the body, you cannot be legally dispossessed of the ball while the player is holding the ball into her body. Now, it, that's not to say that she can just drive out through three or four players with the ball into her body and she can't be touched and take four players out of the game in the process. But it's, it's around that where that, that player is holding that, that ball into her body is where she's slapped on the arm or slapped on the shoulder or maybe even a, a small push or a pull of the jersey. That's where most of it happens. Um, you know, that there's no deliberate contact in ladies' football. It, it is a contact sport, but there's no deliberate bodily contact allowed. That is the rule that, that encapsulates the, the, the ladies' football and, and separates it from the GAA. And the other one then is the charging rule. And there has been a, a, an amendment to that from Congress this year. Now, it, it may not show up at, at goal games levels, but certainly at the higher levels, which some of you referees will be, and, and may already air refereeing at, at, at higher levels. Um, the charging rule, so again, the player coming out with the ball and trying to drive out through a couple of players, um, may, maybe making minimal contact, that would be just a charge. But if that player turns the shoulder and hits them into the chest, that'll get you a yellow card. 
or if you deliberately you know charge at somebody with with force and intent that's going to pick you up a red so they are the ones that it's the charging rule that you know you'll hear a lot of it in your ear from the managers but going back to the conflict and we had a great talk with Sue Carty who would have been involved in in rugby at a very very high level she gave a talk to us national referees a couple of years ago and one of the things she said to us was you are going to hear that conflict but don't take it personally they're shouting at the ref not you and to remember that that it's not shane curley they're not having a go at shane curley you're just a referee and to remember that and it is one of the best pieces of advice that i've heard from um from any talk that that i've been given so yeah, you know what? You, you've actually robbed my last question because the last yeah. question I was going to ask you was: Had you won before we wrap up? Um, have you one bit of advice you'd give to aspiring referees? So I'll take that as yours. And Sinead, if, if you had one line as well, or one bit of advice for aspiring referees, just to wrap it up, um, and hopefully with a few more of these in the future. But if you get the new referees or young referees back on the pitches, what would that advice be? Uh, just I'd go out and enjoy it. To be honest, um. Like, yeah, like Shane has said, you know, about advice and Claire is saying about have your body, but go out and enjoy it and you will make mistakes. It's about, I think, afterwards the game of that reflection where you can sit back and you can say, listen, I got those three things spot on today. Those two things I need to work on and put it into action in the next, in the next game. But I think, yeah, in order to get, in order to get better, um, and to really get that sense of self-satisfaction from doing a good job at it, then, yeah, you need to be improving all the time. So, yeah, it's, it's good to be nervous. It's, you know, that's a good sign. You, you care about it. Um, and go out, yeah, go out and enjoy it. Um, and like you said, Lynn, you said beforehand, like our games can't go ahead without, without referees. I mean, you know, the referees are so important um, to the game. And so it's the last piece of advice I'd say is maybe not to take on too many games. Um, you know, there, there can be a lot of pressure on now referees to take on maybe five, six games a week. Maybe don't be afraid to say, actually, no, um, my three games is enough this week. You know, don't do yourself a disservice by taking on too many and being tired or not in good form or whatever um, to then go out and, and to ref a game. Yeah, but enjoy it yeah it's worth it in the end yeah <laughs> brilliant um so just to wrap up we did say we'd keep you to time uh thank everyone for tuning in today and i know we'll have plenty watching back as well but a huge thanks to shane and sinead and best of luck on the pitches over the coming weeks and um, i know every thank team you. is dying to get back out and playing games so you're going to be keeping busy and of course to claire for the amount of work she's doing for referee education for lgfa across all strands um, and you can see even the profile that's, that's trying to be give, given to referees because of the importance of them. So thanks a million to Claire for all of that. So just to wrap up and say thanks to everyone and enjoy your games and best of luck back at the pitches. And any questions you have, I'm sure to make contact with your county board. Um, they'll be able to help you out or your referee coordinator. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. See you. Thanks. Thanks. Good luck, everyone.